Thank you. Um, Doosters, uh, if that's the collective term for people who go to the do lectures, um, I'm honoured to be here. It's absolutely fantastic. What I had never thought I would do in my life is give this presentation wearing my gardening shoes. And for that, for me, I'm very grateful to be able to cross that bridge. That's really kind. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, what I've been doing over the last, uh, well, mainly the most uh, part of my working life. And uh, I'm going to illustrate it by running through this uh, slideshow, the dreaded slideshow. There's quite a lot of graphics, so I'm going to try and keep it going and, and uh, tell the story quite fast. The problem that I wanted to address actually results in one person dying every 24 seconds. It act actually is twice the death rate that occurs from malaria every single year. It kills uh, that many people, but it also tragically it transmits over 20 million cases of hepatitis and many hundreds of thousands of HIV cases every single year. And you might be surprised to learn that it is a humble, simple injection given uh, by a healthcare worker to a patient. And this is the problem that I set out to try and solve. This issue here results in, uh, in this case, in this photograph, a quack, an untrained doctor, injecting an older man um, with full trust between the two. First of all, the quack knows he's not going to be discovered because the older man isn't going to challenge him because he's grateful for the medical treatment. And secondly, uh, the quack trusts, the, sorry, the older man trusts that the quack is going to give him exactly what he needs. What happens a number of times is that these syringes are used again and again and again on patient to patient. And each time that occurs, the viruses in one patient can be transmitted to the viruses in another. Quite ironic, really, when you think that this is about healthcare. 62% of all injections given in India are unsafe. And to illustrate that, these three beautiful, charming children that I met in an orphanage in Delhi were absolutely enchanting when we met them, but they had a couple of features all common with each other. First of all, they were all HIV positive. Secondly, they'd all been infected by a doctor or a nurse through an injection. And fourthly, one, uh, thirdly, when their parents had found out, their family had found out that they were HIV, they threw them out on the street and they became orphans, and that's why they were in this orphanage. And sadly, two of these kids are no longer with us. 70% of injections in Africa result in the patient reporting a fever in the coming two or three days. And that is nothing to do with the injectant, with the medicine. It's all to do with the pathogens that are on the needle or in the syringe infecting the uh, patient in his bloodstream. Another example is that 20 million injections are reckoned to be delivered with blood on the needle which is already infected with the HIV uh, virus. In Pakistan, 70% of all injections are unsafe. And really worryingly, 90% of all the injections given in Pakistan are unnecessary. The average number of injections given to a Pakistani is 14 per year, way above the average. And the end result is, apart from all this human death and destruction and suffering, is that the economy suffers to the tune of around 120 billion dollars every single year. Around one third of that is unnecessary and augmented healthcare costs because of the infection needs to be treated. And two thirds of it, because people become ill, is because of lost GDP and lost opportunities because they're not able to work. There are three reasons why this problem exists. There's reuse, which I've just touched on. Here in Pakistan, this lady was being treated for an acid burn on her face 10 years before. And during that treatment, and in several injections, became infected with hepatitis B. And here she is being treated for the hepatitis B um, 10 years later. So a, a perfect example of that. This is the scene that I see commonly when I'm traveling around the developing world, a bath of warm water. Now, this isn't Dettol. This is just warm water with needles floating in it and an old glass syringe. And the patient is asked to take their pick of which needle they want to use. And this doctor in, a, in a, a clinic very nearby, I asked him how many injections he had given that day. He said about 25. And I asked him this question, where is the syringe that you use today? And he held up this one syringe. And I couldn't see any in the bin, none in a safety box. 
and they, that was literally the only syringe he had used on those 25 patients. So I asked him if I could take his photograph. I took it, hit him, and ran as fast as I could. They use commonly like pens and scissors. And this may be the world record holder. As you can see here, the ink has worn off the barrel um, because of the, where the thumb always went on, on the, uh, the doctor's thumb went during the injection. And this has probably been used over 100 times to have worn off the ink on the barrel. And that literally was lying on the doctor's desk when I walked in. Next, I'm going to show you a short undercover video that was taken without anyone's knowledge in a public hospital in India. These nurses were filmed secretly in a government hospital for 30 minutes. The tray they are using has medicine on it for all the patients on the floor, yet they only have two syringes. During this time, not once was a new syringe taken from a packet. The nurses openly throw the syringes back in the tray, then pick them up again to give the next injection, and not one patient or bystander ever challenges them. And several of those people in that ward had HIV, and of course that's being spread around innocence. The next subject is recycling. This happens a lot with many products around the developing world, and that's not uh, uncommon, and it's a very good thing if it isn't going to have this end result. Here you can see syringes being weighed, they're valued like that. And here you can see a bath outside the back of a public hospital, which is actually washing the syringes en masse. If you look down on it, you can see the numbers involved on a daily basis that um, are being recycled by, this, by the hospital staff back upstairs to be used the next day. And if you look carefully, you can obviously see blood remnants on the syringes. And these are being washed in that water, infecting all the other products being dried in the sun and then taking them up, taken upstairs. A little girl collecting six o'clock in the morning. This is in Islamabad, a seven-year-old girl. She has a job. She collects syringes from where it says in the background there in Urdu Health Center. These are her brothers and they run a recycling um, center with their mum and dad. Uh, they empty out their swag bags and in it they find syringes. These are very valuable to them because they have that resale, very high resale value. And while they're doing it, they prick themselves, they cut themselves, and of course you can imagine the infections that come out of that. But it is a very, very sophisticated market, and all the recycling yards um, around the area actually collect up all the goods and put them on to, um, put them on to uh, these carts, and they're taken away to be used, uh, washed, repackaged, and resold in the markets. There's also misuse, the third area. And this is a bizarre story that I found in Indonesia, where in a school uh, playground, uh, the kids have um, uh, toy stores, which they're able to buy toys in during the break. And they're very, very cheap, these plastic toys. And here you can see, if you can make out um, in the darkness, uh, he's holding a bag of syringes, which are hot, uh, next door to the plastic digger. Um, and what they use them for is they use them for a very uh, fun game of water pistols, if you can see the water flying through the air. And they have sophisticated scoring systems, and they're laughing, and the water's going on their face, and they're having great fun, and they drink from the syringes. But when you look at them afterwards, you find out that the syringes have already been used for a medical purpose. And here you can see some blood and some rubbish inside the barrel. And of course, you wouldn't like that for your children, so why should they be having them for theirs? And we track this back to the toy wholesaler, and here you can see bins where those plastic diggers are, plastic guns, uh, cap guns, but also syringes that are being wholesaled. So I was very interested. We, we obviously, I said I, we tracked back the story, and we went to find how um, where these were coming from, how they were neatly packaged in bags of ten for whatever the price was. And what we found out was that the mum who ran this uh, wholesaler was actually using her kids to wash secondhand used medical equipment out, dry them in the sun, which you can see here, and then they were being bundled up and sold to the kids. And ironically, at twice the price than if the kids had gone to a pharmacy and bought them in a sterile pack. Normal syringes are horrible, and this is the problem. Because they can be reused, they are reused. And just to give you an idea of the scale of this problem, there are around 50 billion syringes made on the planet every single year. 
And they deliver many more injections, obviously, because in the developing world, the average reuse rate is around four times per syringe um, to deliver four injections. In 1984, I read a newspaper article, and it, and it was talking about HIV, and that was what I was really looking for. Um, the story goes back a long, a long way before that. When I was about six, I had this kind of visitation, if you like, and it said, you will be looking for a big problem to solve. And that's what I had been looking for. So when I was 23, I read this newspaper article and it predicted one day that HIV would be spread by syringes. Sadly, now it's not just HIV, it's many, many viruses. Um, but that was what put me on the road. And from that moment, I decided that was what I was going to do this lifetime. What I came up with after three years of study, and that's a, a whole other story, is I came up with a, a design brief for myself. I decided that if I could make a product, and that would be one of the interventions to this product problem, if I could make a product that could be made on existing machinery, could be made for the same price, and could be used in the same way, yet had a safety feature in it so that the syringe couldn't be used more than once, then I would be onto a winner. The solution uh, that I came up with then is called K1, and we're in production today. And this is what it looks like. These are just some CAD drawings. Um, there's a valve molded into the top of the plunger, and when you use it, the valve breaks. Here's one of my products. I know you can't all see it, but I have some extras if anyone wants to see it afterwards. So here's our product. You use it in exactly the same way you would a normal syringe. You inject, and then you throw it away. Now, if someone wants to use it again, either on purpose or, deliber uh, on purpose or by accident, they'll pull back the plunger, and it locks, snaps, and separates, and you can't use it again. A bottle of Coca-Cola in the developing world is around 50 cents. And Coca-Cola is based in every single country in the world. And it's not there for tourists. It's there for the, ubiquitous, the um, indigenous population. And it is a viable product for Coca-Cola to sell at that price range. One of our syringes, which is the normal price for a syringe, costs 5 cents, a tenth of the bottle of uh, Coca-Cola. And so they are eminently affordable by every single person in the world. And actually, just an interesting side story to this photograph is that this photograph I took in 2001, and I started in 1984, and it was the first syringe that we sold and I ever saw being used in Cambodia. And so that was a 17-year gestation period to get the product out into the marketplace. Since then, since 2001, we've sold around 3.5 billion of these products through a licensing arrangement with 13 uh, factories. And we've also been credited with saving at least 10 or more million fatal infections from passing from one patient to another. So 10 million plus lives, of which we're very, very proud. Some examples of how this works. We supplied this hospital in uh, Dar es Salaam called Temeki Hospital with our product for a five-year period under an American funding program. And the results were absolutely spectacular. They used the product, they loved it, everyone got used to it. But what we found afterwards at the end of the five-year period, taking it from a baseline study, was that the average inpatient stay in this hospital went from seven days to three. So we were giving four more days production to every single person who came through that hospital. And we were saving that hospital an enormous amount of money and the, uh, the aggravation to the family for losing their money earner if it was one of the people who went out to work. So an um, incredible benefit. But there are other knock-on benefits which we learned about where the nurses, because they were using these products, started washing their hands. They started becoming proud rather than hiding their their, um, their uh, practice, they actually started showing off by washing their hands in front of the patients, which, believe you me, many organizations around the world have tried hand washing campaigns which have never worked, and this just happened as a byproduct. 20 auto disabled syringes, which is the name, generic name for this product, costs a dollar, and that saves around $200 million, uh, $200 for, those, for that $1 spent in downstream costs. We have uh, images that exist from the World Health Organization, and this is what they look like. And we've stolen these to create our campaign called Lifesaver. 
what we were able to do was go to India, where the Ministry of Health wouldn't see me, the 62% reuse, as I'd mentioned, one and a half billion syringes delivering five billion injections, some of them 30 or 40 times, 26 states, 19 languages. How on earth were we going to handle it? So we made a very short film. We took five days to blitz it across India. We showed it um, five and a half thousand times on television, ten and a half thousand radio announcements. And the end result was that with the support from the president of India um, and doing a lot of research, that 720 million people saw this message. And the Minister of Health, who had refused to see me all this time, decided to change the law and mandate the use of these products across all states in India. And 11 of those states have complied fully to date. The program that I run now is called Lifesaver. And it is incredibly simple to uh, be understood by the marketplace. But it's very, very complicated to deliver and has taken me all this time to understand. This is my new friend and hero, the Minister of Health for Tanzania, where we've been piloting this. And what we do, which you can't see clearly here, is we print Lifesaver on every syringe so that the public are aware that that is of good quality and we allow any manufacturer who makes these sort of products to stamp this uh, logo on their product to give the public awareness. We use kind of funky advertising. There are 32,000 of these being printed at the moment, these posters, where a good tomato is the lifesaver representative. The bad tomato is a normal injection, says so in uh, Swahili. But the lifesaver brand, the subtlety of the, it over in the bottom right-hand corner there is, is portrayed to the public, and they get it very, very clearly. So how can we make this bigger? At the moment, we're at about um, 3 or 4% market penetration around the developing world with these products. And my mission is to get that to a far bigger level, to reach a tipping point where uh, my big do is that every injection given in the developing world in the future is safe. Well, I believe firmly in opening it up. I think we've had enough experience that the commercial reality of fighting for our product to have a, a big marketplace has failed dramatically. And it's failed dramatically because of the glass ceiling above us, the incompetence of large health organizations, commercial uh, skullduggery by the big manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine what goes on, and you can imagine some of those issues were why it took 17 years to get this off the ground. So opening it up is the next big thing. And uh, that's what I'm working on at the moment, and raising money so that we can literally decommercialize it and offer an open license to every one of the 600 manufacturers in the world who are making those 50 billion products. Uh, my little do is, if you want to help me, please, is could you tell a few people? Could you put them in touch with me if you think that they might be useful? Could you maybe tweet about this? Could you go on our website and find out more and tell other people? Because for so long, as all the other innovation stories that you've heard today, um, it's a very lonely place if you don't have um, support. And whether we know about it or not, it's just nice to have that momentum with us. <laughs>